Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, kind of mini lecture on chapter 14.5. Um, so this <laughs> comes after chapter 14 in the book, uh, and it's kind of like a short chapter specifically on um, eating disorders and body image disorders. So uh, we'll start with a little conversation about body image. Um, so body image is basically how someone perceives their own body, um, and that can be that can include um, how they feel about their body, how they literally visually see their body, um, and it can also include ways in which the person may um, critique their own body. Um, body image can certainly influence a person's eating behaviors, um, and as we'll see on the next slide, there's um, uh, two different continuum, continua, I guess, <laughs> two different continuums that, that look at um, body image relative to eating behaviors. So we'll see how strongly these two are um, linked. Uh, and then of course, body image can also influence exercise behavior. And that can, that depending on the quality of body image a person is expressing, that can lead to either an exercise addiction or an exercise dependence. Um, and then food restriction. So food restriction is, is the restricting of food generally to achieve some sort of, um, again, real or perceived body image. So disordered eating is a term that is kind of like an umbrella term used to describe a, a variety of different, what we might call atypical eating behaviors that a person might use to achieve or maintain a lower than healthy body weight. And then an eating disorder is an actual classified psychiatric condition that includes both extreme body dis dissatisfaction as well as long-term atypical eating patterns that impair body function. So pretty serious conditions here. Um, and this is the slide that has these two different continuum of um, down here would be body image and then food eating, eating behaviors on top. And so it's a continuum, kind of a spectrum basically. Um, and so a person at any given time could fall on any, any part of this spectrum and can certainly move from one place to another. So um, somebody who has what we might call body ownership or like really healthy body image, um, they feel like their body is beautiful. They feel very secure about their body. They don't feel overly influenced by um, society's, you know, portrayal of what an ideal body might look like. Um, somebody can be there and can move elsewhere along this spectrum, depending on life circumstances or experiences or whatnot. And in the same way, somebody who might be at the other end of this the spectrum with um, or continuum expressing like pretty intense body dissatisfaction, even to the point of body dissociation, where they're feeling totally separate from and distant from their body as if it belongs to someone else. Again, the person doesn't isn't necessarily locked into this frame of mind forever. And then what you'll notice is that, as we said, body image tends to go along with um, eating behaviors. So someone who may be in this end of the um, body image continuum in this at this level of body dissociation is likely to be expressing um, eating disordered eating behaviors. So disordered eating behaviors might be, for example, regularly eating so much to the point of feeling stuffed, um, totally full, beyond full really, and then following that up with intense exercise, potentially purging by vomiting or using um, pills or laxatives, um, potentially having, you know, feeling afraid to eat in front of other people, um, terrified of eating fat, fat rich foods or foods containing fat. So any of those would be considered disordered eating behaviors. You can see kind of a step back from there on the disordered eating continuum would be what we might call disruptive eating patterns. Um, so fasting or avoiding eating for long periods of time in order to, oops, sorry, in order to lose weight or maintain weight. Um, 
feeling a sense of strength when a person can restrict how much they eat. So um, spend some time on this page. This is a really important page, I think, for all of us, because as we'll see, um, eating disorders are relatively prevalent in our society, um, as is body, ima um, body image disorders. Uh, so I think it's helpful just to be able to start to identify some of these characteristics or behaviors either in oneself or in close family members or friends so as to, um, you know, attempt to be a support person um, if someone is experiencing any of these issues or thoughts or feelings. So um, body dysmorphic disorder, we're going to start here. We're going to go through several different types of um, body image disorders and eating disorders. So body dysmorphic disorder, often abbreviated BDD, is a psychiatric condition. Um, that may involve both disordered eating and excessive exercise. And again, oftentimes they'll go together, but not necessarily involving both. Um, body dysmorphic disorder, we can generally say that someone who is diagnosed with BDD um, basically obsesses over a, a perceived defect in their physical body or physical appearance. And that defect may be real or imaginary. Um, and in many cases, it is, in fact, imaginary. Or it may be, it can also be real, but it could be to someone else a pretty small, insignificant defect. Um, body dysmorphic disorder affects males and females pretty equally in the population. Um, so you can see the image that your textbook uses is a pretty fit, very, well, apparently fit, <laughs> lean male. Um, who, when, when he looks in the mirror, sees, you know, potentially, um, maybe not even overweight, but maybe a little bit heavier weight than how this person actually is. So again, that would be sort of that imaginary, quote, defect in this person's appearance. A form of body dysmorphic disorder is something called muscle dysmorphia. Uh, and this is, um, probably what's being portrayed in the picture here, where typically more common in males, where they might, the person might perceive that they are weak and small, even though they are actually quite large and muscular. So again, uh, I think this perceived um, defect or deficit is an important characteristic of BDD. Um, so, We'll talk a little bit about factors that contribute to different types of um, body image disorders or disordered eating. Um, genetics may potentially play a role. Certainly family history of disordered eating plays a strong role. Um, personality as well as other comorbidities we'll see. So other um, health related issues can affect body image and eating behaviors. Media, of course, is an increasingly prevalent factor. And then, of course, there's social and cultural factors um, as well, as far as what, uh, what beautiful might be or what healthy might be. Um, so we, we, your book puts this here following up the conversation on healthy body weight, um, hopefully because we've already laid a good groundwork for what healthy body weight might be um, and recognizing where many of these social, cultural influences, and media portrayals um, can lead people pretty far astray from what healthy might actually be. Uh, so another image from your textbook, um, this idea basically of Photoshopping, used to be not too long ago that Photoshopping was happening you know, in magazines with images of models and other celebrities. Um, but now with the use of like, really um, impressive technology on phones and most people having their own personal phone with this technology on it, now people can actually Photoshop themselves um, and, and create this pretty artificially, quote, enhanced um, visual of themselves. So typically in adulthood, we can understand that these are um, enhanced or photoshopped or edited images. 
But the major issue really here is for adolescents, especially adolescents who may be, again, photoshopping and editing images of themselves and comparing, Im comparing images of themselves to photoshopped images of other you know, people in their peer group or other kids their age or models and celebrities who have also been photoshopped. And so this can, this can be a source of body image disorder um, starting at a pretty young age. Um, and it's, um, we point this out because it's during the adolescent years that a person is actually developing this sense of identity and body image. And so this is when these sociocultural and media influences are really strongest is during these adolescent years. So eating disorders, um, again, these are psychiatric conditions that involve extreme body dissatisfaction as well as long-term eating patterns that negatively affect body functioning. Uh, two very common, well, not very common per se, but two of the more common eating disorders are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. We'll go through each one of these in quite a bit of detail. Um, anorexia nervosa is basically a form of self-starvation which generally leads to a very severe nutrient deficiency or multiple severe nutrient deficiencies. And then bulimia nervosa is recurrent episodes of basically binging, which is extreme overeating, and purging, which is some form of compens compensatory behavior um, to prevent the weight gained from the, ex from the excessive eating that had just occurred. So anorexia nervosa, uh, definitely potentially life-threatening. Um, and again, this is characterized by an extremely low body weight, so that when we talked about BMI being in that underweight category or severely underweight, again, this is achieved through self-starvation and can result in severe undernutrition. Um, it is suggested that one out of 200 females will be affected and 20% of them may actually die or will actually die prematurely of complications related to severe undernutrition. Anorexia nervosa is the most common and deadliest psychiatric disorder in females. In males, we see that this is um, reported in less than 1% of the population, but likely this is underreported um, because we it tends to be that males are less um, willing or perhaps able to seek treatment uh, for such condition, for such disorders relative to females. Um, so typically there is that extreme drive for thinness and as we said, can result in potentially, um, potentially in death. Signs and symptoms of anorexia nervosa. So as we said, this is self-starvation. So one of the perhaps most obvious signs, although sometimes it can be pretty well hidden, would be extreme restrictive eating practices. Um, other things that might be slightly more obvious, um, no menstrual period for at least three months, and this is, this is called amenorrhea, and that would obviously be in females, not in males. Um, and then, of course, you would start to see that extreme thinness as well. Um, let's see, males tend to focus on being lean and muscular, they focus more on body composition, percent fat mass relative to, to percent lean muscle mass, um, and potentially maybe less concerned with total body weight. Um, but the most obvious sign would be the extreme restrictive eating practices, um, the extreme thinness, and uh, in females, that amenorrhea. Um, so criteria for diagnosis would be a refusal on the part of the person to maintain a body weight that is considered normal or healthy for their age and height, so based on the BMI scale. Um, another criteria would be an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat. Um, again, BMI measurements are going to be used to assess normal uh, for age and height weight. Um, and then there may be like a denial of the seriousness of the body of the low body weight. Health risks. So again, um, undernutrition, malnutrition. So 
total calorie um, deficit and nutrient deficit as well. Uh, what we start to see, especially as this really does progress, um, is that the body will start to break down lean tissue mass and use that as a source of energy. You might recall when we talked about proteins um, in chapter six, uh, and again, talked about metabolism and how where the body derives energy from, I've said hopefully <laughs> several times that protein is generally a last resort um, energy substrate for the body. And when we do start to rely on protein as an energy substrate, it is likely because we've begun to break down our own lean tissue mass. And so that's precisely what's happening in any form of starvation, including anorexia, which is anorexia nervosa, which is self-starvation. Um, just like with amenorrhea, so amenorrhea is an example of a non-vital body functioning shutting down. Um, right, the, the female doesn't need the reproductive cycle for her own survival, for their own survival. Um, so we're going to start to see body functions like that shutting down so that the body can conserve energy and take from non-vital organs first. Um, then we would also see electrolyte imbalances, and this is part of what can cause um, death. It can also cause heart failure, which could be the cause of death. Uh, just a helpful slide here to go over all of the different, all the effects on the different body systems. So these would be other uh, signs and symptoms, some of them very late signs and symptoms, however, but some signs and symptoms to look for as well. Um, so hair may become really thin, dry, and brittle. There may be hair loss. Uh, the skin would also become quite dry and bruise easily. It may also become really pale, grayish, and discolored. Nails would be quite brittle. Um, there may likely would be anemia. The immune system would become really weak. So, this, you know, people expressing anorexia nervosa would be at um, would likely be getting sick much more often. Again, dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. There may be renal failure. Um, we would see amenorrhea. We would see likely infertility and a disruption of all sex hormone production. Again, we're going to see significant muscle loss. Uh, we would see mood changes for sure, um, particularly because of changes in serotonin and other neurotransmitter production due to the um, decreasing glucose supply to the brain. We would also see abnormal thyroid production, thyroid hormone production. Um, blood pressure would drop. Um, heart rate um, usually would drop. Uh, dizziness and fainting would become much more common. Uh, if an electrocardiogram was um, administered, you'd probably notice abnormal heart rhythms. And again, there could be sudden death due to ventricular arrhythmia. In the gastrointestinal system, we would see abdominal pain due to severe lack of food coming in. There may even be bloating. Um, there may be acute pancreatitis and even constipation. Uh, of course, we would see decreased bone mineral density, which is osteopenia. Um, we would see a decreased ability to absorb calcium into the bones due to low estrogen. Um, yeah, an increased bone loss. All right, and then on to bulimia nervosa. So another psychiatric condition characterized, um, however, slightly, quite differently. So this one, uh, as we mentioned briefly before, is characterized by recurrent episodes of binge eating and then purging. So binge eating is a consumption or defined as a consumption of food, a quantity of food that is large for the person and for the amount of time in which it is eaten. Um, uh, we see that about bulimia nervosa affects about one half of one percentage of, um, of females and about one tenth of a percentage of males, at least as far as is reported. Um, <laughs> sorry, these are kind of out of order. And then purging. So again, bulimia nervosa is binge eating followed by purging. So purging is um, 
can be kind of can look like several different things, but this would occur after the binge eating episode, um, and is performed as a means of counteracting the potential weight gain that would come about from having eaten that large quantity of food so quickly. So um, purging can look like vomiting, can look like use of laxatives to expedite the elimination process, could look like use of diuretics, um, could actually just be a period of fasting, um, or could look like excessive exercise. So again, binge eating is a large quantity of food for the person in a small amount of time. Symptoms of bulimia nervosa, so again, the recurrent episodes of binging followed by purging, um, which, which your textbook calls inappropriate compensatory behavior to prevent weight gain. Um, the binge eating occurs at least twice a week for three months uh, in order to be diagnosed as bulimia nervosa, on average at least twice a week for three months time. What's unique about bulimia nervosa, or different, I should say distinct, well, I guess a lot is distinct relative to anorexia nervosa, but in bulimia nervosa, um, oftentimes body weight does not get as severely low as in anorexia nervosa. However, it is the body weight and the body shape that do seem to influence the person's um, perception of self, so their body image, um, and that's typically what leads to these behaviors. So signs or symptoms of bulimia nervosa, um, a chronically inflamed and sore throat, because if, if the person is engaging in recurrent um, vomiting, definitely could also see swollen glands, uh, swollen lymph nodes in the neck and below the jawline. There may also be tooth decay due to the purging. Um, there could be GERD, gastrointestinal reflux disease, again, due to the self-induced um, vomiting. Um, there could be GI distress from laxative abuse. Uh, there could definitely be kidney disorders from diuretic use. And there would definitely be severe dehydration as well as um, electrolyte imbalances because of the purging practices. So the health risks associated with bulimia nervosa, that electrolyte imbalance, um, dehydration, again, loss of sodium and potassium, which can lead to um, heart arrhythmias or regular heartbeat. And then gastrointestinal issues would be the other major health risk. So inflammation, ulceration, and possible rupture of the esophagus and or stomach. There would also be chronic irregular bowel movement and constipation. And then a third thing we might see, again, would be dental um, issues, as well as other um, health problems related to the oral cavity in the mouth. Um, so separate from bulimia nervosa, we have something called binge eating disorder. And this is a, a basically binge eating that is not followed by purging. So this is estimated to be in about 1.2% of the adult population. People with binge eating disorder are three to six times more likely to become obese than those without an eating disorder. And um, oftentimes, binge eating disorder is triggered by foods that are high in fat and high in sugar. Um, psychological consequences of binge eating disorder would be low self-esteem, depression, negative thoughts, and avoidance of social contact. Criteria for diagnosing binge eating disorder, the binge eating behavior has to occur a minimum of one time per week, again, going on for three months time. Um, there would be um, eating behaviors would include eating abnormally rapidly, eating large amounts of food, eating until uncomfortably full, that sensation, those feelings of embarrassment, guilt, and potentially disgust with oneself for having done the binge eating, and then the depression. Um, yeah, and most people who uh, people who are diagnosed with binge eating disorder do experience a significant amount of distress associated with the binge eating behavior itself. 
And then we have um, another sort of subgroup of um, disordered eating behaviors, which are um, categorized as otherwise specified feeding and eating disorders. Um, and these are all actually syndromes, meaning that there are two or more distinct um, health issues going on at the same time. So we'll talk about night eating syndrome, purging disorder, atypical anorexia nervosa, and orthorexia. So night eating syndrome, um, this is a combination of an eating disorder, a sleep disorder, and a mood disorder. Um, in night eating syndrome, a person is basically eating during the night and in the evening, and they're technically not hungry during the day. Certainly night eating syndrome is associated with a de depressed mood and insomnia. Um, and night eating syndrome is an important one to uh, look out for because it is strongly associated with obesity, which we now know um, increases our risk for chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, and sleep apnea. And obviously many of these can circle back and actually further um, perpetuate the night eating syndrome. Then we have purging disorder and atypical anorexia nervosa. So purging is a recurrent purging behavior um, in the absence of binge eating. So there is no binge eating, kind of the opposite of um, binge eating disorder. This is just purging disorder. So it's a recurrent purging behavior with the um, goal of influencing body weight or body shape. And then atypical anorexia nervosa is in this case, a person is meeting all the criteria for anorexia nervosa with one exception, which is that the individual's weight um, is actually within the normal range, despite having experienced significant weight loss and despite the um, self-starvation that is characteristic of anorexia nervosa. And then orthorexia nervosa, um, I guess, I, if in my line of work, I'm starting to see this a bit more commonly. Um, orthorexia nervosa is described as an obsession with healthful eating. Um, so as of yet, there's not really a standardized method for defining, measuring, or assessing the prevalence of orthorexia nervosa. Um, there have been proposed criteria for diagnosing it. So three things. Um, there, there would be an obsession or preoccupation with healthful eating, and there would be feelings of guilt if this rule is broken, or if the rules around healthful eating are broken, and these would be self-imposed rules. Um, there would also be some distress associated with healthy eating itself, um, again, kind of going along with that obsession around healthful eating. Uh, and this obsession with healthful foods would be unexplained by other medical or religious reasons. So again, very uh, sort of self-imposed rules, self-imposed obsession um, with this healthy eating. And then lastly, we have something called relative energy deficiency in sports. And we did mention this um, briefly, I think in the lecture on hydration. I want to say, or bones, maybe it was on bones, but we've talked briefly about relative energy deficiency in sports at least once before. Um, so this is basically someone who is engaged in sports and uh, is not getting enough uh, nutrient intake to meet the energy demands. And in this case, when we talk about nutrients, we're talking specifically about energy consumption, um, so caloric intake, so the, the macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Of course, wherever there's inadequate energy consumption, it's not unlikely that there is also inadequate micronutrient intake as well. So um, relative energy deficiency in sports, abbreviated REDS. So this encompasses health problems, all health problems that are associated with inadequate energy consumption uh, to meet the energy demands of the individual. We don't, this doesn't only occur in athletes, but it certainly occurs most commonly in athletes. So these health problems that are associated with REDS are physiological health problems. So we would see 
effects on basal metabolic rate. We would see impaired immunity. We would say impaired protein synthesis. Basically, all of these body systems would be impaired. Uh, we would see declining bone health. We would see declining reproductive capacity and fertility. We would see impaired cardiovascular health. I um, mean, we would also see what's called the female athlete triad, which is three specific clinical conditions. So the female athlete triad um, includes, again, low um, caloric energy, low energy availability to, to do work. Um, there would be mental dis uh, menstrual, excuse me, menstrual dysfunction, such as amenorrhea, so not having an adequate period for three months. Um, and then we would also see low bone density uh, due to reduced estrogen production due to low caloric intake. So the female athlete triad, um, again, this one we will definitely see in active females, often active adolescent females. So females who are in an intense period of growth and development. So in those, basically in those teen years. And then this female athlete triad does not occur in all female athletes. I mean, it doesn't occur, well, it can occur in any sport, I guess, but we see it fairly commonly in sports that also have um, sort of an, an appearance, a perceived appearance component. So things like figure skating, diving, gymnastics, and dancing, specifically ballet dancing. Um, warning signs for the female athlete triad, uh, excessive dieting potentially and or weight loss, excessive exercise, a stress fracture is usually a good common sign, uh, although uh, of course, hopefully you would catch it before it gets to the point of stress fracture, but that's often a telltale sign, again, especially in developing um, adolescent females. Uh, and there may also be, again, this, this body image or self-esteem that is very strongly dictated by uh, body weight and body shape. So again, just another image from your textbook, just showing all of the uh, physiologic health issues that arise from relative energy deficiency in sports, coupled with the female athlete triad. So the female athlete triad, again, is low energy intake, um, impaired menstrual function, and impaired uh, bone health. Uh, and that's what you see over here in the triad. But then, of course, you have all these other effects of relative energy deficiency in sport. So where you see the female athlete triad, I actually almost wish that the arrow went this way, too, because where you see the female athlete triad, you're likely to see all of these um, at risk, too. Okay, and then a couple um, slides on how to treat eating disorders. So. Um, it typically requires a multidisciplinary approach, right? We've mentioned that these are all psychiatric conditions. So generally support from a psychologist, a mental health practitioner, a therapist would, would go a long way. Um, of course, the patient themselves uh, needs to be a required part of the um, treatment. They have to buy into it. They have to accept it. They have to feel comfortable with it. So not all treatment approaches will work for every person experiencing um, disordered eating. A physician should also be on board just to uh, be able to um, assess all those various physio physio <laughs> physiological uh, functionings of the body and make sure that they are improving with treatment. Um, a nutritionist would probably be a good one to have on board too, to help the person build back more healthful eating habits and to include foods in a way that the body can um, digest and assimilate, uh, depending on the severity of the disordered eating at the time. Um, if it's um, REDS, so if it is an athlete and if there is a coach, the coach should also be involved uh, to make sure that the coach isn't pushing the athlete too far, too hard. Um, and then certainly uh, support people, um, friends and family members, um, and this goes in both directions, too. I mean, making sure that friends and family members are well educated as to the circumstances of um, the disorder and understanding what the patient might need 
from family members and friends. So how to how to support a person um, recovering from these uh, types of disordered behaviors. The nutrition approach. So the goal with the with nutrition in recovering from an eating disorder would be to, of course, restore the body to a healthy body weight and to resolve any of the nutrition related issues. Um, this is maybe less nutrition related, but um, I guess it would be both nutrition and psychology kind of hand in hand, but addressing the body image issues as a as they are related to weight. And so as the person regains weight to build back up to a healthy body weight, being able to assess uh, and kind of um, reestablish basically new body image um, thoughts and ideals. Um, again, we'd have to um, plan foods accordingly, depending on the severity of the condition. If the gut health has been um, pretty severely deteriorated, like in the case of ongoing anorexia nervosa, uh, we'd have to start with um, very easy to digest foods, a lot of broths. Um, uh, yeah, so not going right to, you know, salads and burritos or something, but starting with very simple foods that the body can actually um, digest and assimilate themselves without having to do much digestive work. And then, of course, slowly working back up to um, more solid foods. Um, an assessment of food situations, so food environments that might influence the person's eating behaviors and kind of working through some of those situations. Again, this would, a lot of this is sort of like nutrition and psychological therapy. Uh, they go hand in hand very strongly. Um, potentially working together to establish a food plan for healthy weight maintenance so that once healthy body weight is restored, um, the next step would be maintaining it and not kind of reverting back into these disordered eating patterns. Also, again, addressing some of the negative feelings and negative emotions that come about from eating and addressing trigger foods. And then again, there may be inpatient therapy, working with a, a counselor, a therapist, as well as outpatient counseling. So in some cases, someone may actually have to um, go into a treatment facility and be uh, monitored if, if the condition, again, especially in cases of severe anorexia nervosa, um, they may actually be on IV nutrition support before they even get to eating foods. Um, so therapy in that setting can be very helpful in those early stages, as well as therapy continuing once a person is in outpatient and on their own again. Okay, so that's it for chapter 14 and a half. Uh, just a little quick overview of some common um, eating disorders. So as always, there are these, oh, I guess I didn't put the review questions. <laughs> um, I will make sure that they're in the lecture notes for this chapter so that you can at least review them that way in the lecture notes because they're not here in the lecture. Alrighty, thanks all for listening and we'll see you next time.